This is the lecture of social psychology given on Monday or Tuesday, April 20th and Friday, uh, April 23rd. We saw in the videos about the researchers uh, looking at various ways that being in social situations can affect your behavior. And the first one that we're going to start with is cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when our behavior and our beliefs don't align. This makes us feel uncomfortable, which Leon Festinger termed as cognitive dissonance. And when we experience cognitive dissonance, it doesn't feel good. And we often, unless we have sufficient reward uh, to reinforce our, that behavior, uh, we would like to get rid of the dissonance. We'd like to remove this dissonance. And so as a result, what we see is that we <clears throat> tend to uh, change either our beliefs or our behavior. Um, most often our beliefs, because changing our behavior is often influenced by other people. And if you remember seeing the video, you had the guy and the girl. And the guy uh, felt okay lying because he got a sufficient reward. But the girl, because she didn't get sufficient reward, she actually changed her belief and believed that that, that experiment was fun. Conformity is when we adjust our beliefs or our behavior to meet that of the group. And conformity happens all the time in our society. But why do we conform? Well, we can form for one of two reasons. Normative social influence is when we conform because the unanimity of the group, everyone together, uh, has convinced us, has made us feel so uncomfortable that we change so that we don't feel left out, that we don't feel exiled, that we don't feel shunned. Uh, but on the other hand, we may also conform due to informational social influence or informational conformity. And this is when the group convinces us that we're wrong. Now, a lot of the power of inconformity is the unanimity of the group. If the group is not unanimous, uh, there is a lot less likelihood that conformity will occur. The most extreme type of conformity is when we are obedient um, and often to obedient to authority figures. Now, Stanley Milgram found that in his experiment, uh, there were two things that caused obedience to be the greatest. One was when obedient, when the researcher was seen as an authority figure. Uh, and so he did two versions of it, one where he had an actor play as a researcher, the other when he had the actor play as some guy just running the experiment. And when the guy was a researcher, therefore a seemingly legit authority figure, uh, he got much better obedience. The other one is when the environment is one that lends itself to obedience. Uh, Milgram in his study uh, did two versions, one at a really famous laboratory at Yale and the other uh, at uh, an office building in New Haven, Connecticut. And he found, again, that in the office building, obedience was much lower because it was not an environment which people were ex expected themselves to have to obey. Now we look at group dynamics and behavior. Groups are a collection of people that all have similar interests or similar beliefs or similar ideas. But with groups, the, the collection of people need to remain together uh, for a group to completely uh, solidify. And there are three things that keeps groups together. One is norms. Norms are rules, either written or unwritten, which keeps the group together. The second is ideology. Ideology is a set of beliefs that everybody in the group shares. The third is commitment, and that's where everybody in the group is uh, committed to supporting one another along with supporting the group as a whole. And what this does is it really ties people to the group itself. For every group, there's a leader, and leadership is really important because the leaders are those who guide the behavior and the beliefs of the group. But in some cases, the leaders are so charismatic that uh, they literally change the beliefs and or behaviors of the group. We call this transformational leadership. And this is when you have such a strong leader that the group itself alters its beliefs or alters its way of behaving. There's three distinct leadership styles. The authoritarian leader uh, makes all the decisions, sets all the norms, um, and expects them to be followed. 
the laissez-faire leader sits back and lets the group make decisions. The democratic leader will let the group make decisions, but will use his or her influence uh, in order to uh, to in, to sway the group uh, towards the decision that they may prefer. When we're in groups, sometimes our performance is affected. Sometimes being in front of a group makes us feel more confident, more secure. Maybe it uh, it challenges us more and our performance increases. And we call this social facilitation. And on the other hand, we have the opposite, which is social inhibition. And that's where the presence of the group makes us feel nervous and uncomfortable and our performance suffers. Sometimes when we're in a group, we may uh, experience uh, either by doing it or by having somebody else in a group carry out social loafing. And this is when someone lessens their responsibility uh, due to the influence of being in a group. And finally, sometimes being in a large group, especially, especially when you're an anonymous member of that large group, can cause people to carry out behaviors they wouldn't normally carry out. And we call this de-individuation. And it's when someone feels comfortable doing something that they may not normally do because they're a faceless anonymous member of a mob. When we're in a group, uh, we will, we often um, have to adjust our way of thinking. We conform to the group, but especially in our beliefs. And we refer to this as group think. Um, group think means that we're going to adjust our beliefs either for normative or informational social influence, the conformity that we have there. Uh, now, one thing that's a little bit dangerous about group think is that it can push people's beliefs to the extremes. Uh, when people get into the into groups, they often their beliefs will often push them uh, not towards the the kind of the center, the gray area of it, but more towards the strong opinions, the one side or another. And this is called group polarization. And it's especially dangerous when you have two opposing groups who uh, have pretty extreme beliefs and are who are extremely polarized, like in our current political climate. All groups have specific behaviors and beliefs that tie them together. We refer to this as their culture. Now, we can apply this term culture to many different groups, but the elements that make up culture are things like the language one speaks, the food one eats, uh, the clothes that one wears, uh, and um, the behaviors that they do and the beliefs that they have. Um, so this can be a, a new group, a very... A small short-term group, but it can also be like a long-term group like uh, a nation of the world um, or a religion. Uh, there are two types of cultures. Collectivist cultures, ones that practice collectivism, um, have the belief that everybody in the group should uh, be willing to make some sacrifices for the common good. Um, and you can see this evidence in countries like New Zealand and Japan. Uh, individualist cultures, however, um, believe that it's every person for themselves, which also can be a good thing because certainly it uh, lends itself to hard work and perseverance and you know striving for success. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't necessarily help out the group itself. Uh, and this is an individualist culture. And obviously the best example of this is the United States. Sometimes when a group experiences negative attitudes, either implicit or explicit, we would call this prejudice. Uh, these negative attitudes can come in a variety of different forms. Um, they can come as uh, ne prejudicial beliefs or negative beliefs, uh, which we would refer to as stereotypes. Now, some stereotypes are overtly harmful and explicitly harmful. Others, on the other hand, may even be complementary towards a certain group, especially an ethnic group um, or a gender. But on the other hand, uh, those stereotypes are still harmful because they're labeling someone uh, who may not be, who may not share that characteristic with it just because they're a member of that very, very large scale group. Sometimes prejudice can come uh, in the form of emotion. For explicit prejudice, it often comes in hostility, um, which is uh, outright uh, kind of rejection and, um, and ridiculing of someone due to the group that they're a part of. Uh, and sometimes uh, in implicit uh, prejudice, it becomes also fear. And with fear, uh, they, that may cause them uh, to carry out actions that 
uh, belittle a person um, and dehumanize them. Um, and then finally, ultimately, this can often lead to discrimination, which is prejudicial action. Um, and that's when, when one carries out a behavior uh, that is um, either explicitly or sometimes implicitly uh, negative towards uh, someone due to the, uh, the group that they're a part of. And this can be the color of their skin. It can be the country of origin. It can be uh, their religion. It can be their sexual orientation, their gender identity or anything. Um, but ultimately, um, these negative attitudes are harmful um, and they uh, cause uh, they cause trauma. But why does it happen? Well, it happens because of in-groups and out-groups. In-groups are groups that we're in uh, that we share a characteristic with them. And we may be part of multiple in-groups. Um, and out-groups are groups that we are directly opposed to. Um, they may, there may be other groups that might be kind of allied with our beliefs, or there may be other groups which may be not completely against us, but outgroups are ones that are directly opposed to us. Now, sometimes we experience in-group and then also out-group bias. In-group bias is when we want to excuse the negative beliefs or behaviors of someone if they're within our in-group. And the reason for that is because we can envision ourselves through empathy. We can envision ourselves in their place. Um, and we don't want to see ourselves as negative. We don't want to believe that of ourselves. And so uh, we will often kind of have a bias and rationalize someone's beliefs or behavior uh, due to the fact that they're part of our in-group. And yet in the out-group, we are much more likely uh, to uh, to blame their character and who they are as an individual, much of which is made up uh, from the group that they're a part of, um, as uh, when they're when we're attributing their behavior, um, and especially when we're carrying out bad behavior, we will probably use the fundamental attribution error, where we may say that uh, a person's behavior is due to uh, internal attribution, who they are, and part of who they are, then it comes from the group that they're a part of, and this can cause us to. Uh, experience the scapegoat theory. And the scapegoat theory basically says that when something goes wrong, we are much more likely to assume that it's a member of our, of an out group uh, due to the fact that they're different and we have uh, negative attitudes and prejudice towards them. Now we look at aggression and attraction, two things which are mostly opposed. So what is aggression? Well, Aggression is hostile beliefs or actions towards someone. Um, and aggression can be uh, you know, cathartic. It can help relieve stress. Um, but in many cases, aggression uh, does much more harm than good. Uh, aggression has a lot of different influences. Biochemically, aggression comes from testosterone. And even though men have more testosterone than women, women still do have testosterone. And that biochemical uh, influence of, of the hormone uh, can certainly influence aggressive tendencies. Uh, but aggression is, can also come from and have psychological and social explanations and social beliefs. The fr frustration aggression principle is the psychological belief about, fr about frustration, the explanation for frustration, which says that when we experience frustration, we think about it, therefore it's psychological. And the more we think about things, about something that frustrates us, uh, the more uh, it will continue to frustrate us until ultimately will lead to aggressive behavior and aggressive beliefs. Socially, we can also learn uh, aggression in certain environments and certain social situations due to modeling. Uh, when we watch someone else carry out behavior, if, they're, uh, if they are aggressive and they serve as a role model, uh, to us, then we may model that behavior. And when we find ourselves in a similar situation, uh, go to that behavior that's been modeled for us. As far as attraction goes, um, we have a lot of different ways that we can choose our friends and partners. Um, this is called the laws of attraction. One way is proximity, and this is when someone is physically close to another. And this doesn't just refer to ro romantic relationships, but also platonic ones too. Proximity is when we choose our friends and our partners because of the physical closeness to them, the physical distance. Um, and so certainly you've probably had it where you may have been sitting next to somebody in a class and you didn't know them at the beginning of the year. And by the end of the year, you're, you're their best friend. Uh, we can also uh, be attracted to people or connect with people due to reward values. Um, if they 
uh, reward our behavior with positive praise, with reinforcement, um, then uh, we will, uh, then we often will find ourselves saying that uh, this person is someone that I want to connect to because we can continue to get reinforcement. One thing that's really interesting is that we often choose our friends and partners on physical appearance. Now, for romantic relationships, this probably isn't a surprise. But for platonic relationships, this also applies. And what we tend to do is we tend to pick our friends. Now, we might use some of the other ways too, but we may pick our friends when we look at physical appearance uh, with those that are at the same level of our own perception of our own attractiveness. So if we think that we're really attractive, then we're going to uh, unconsciously seek out the friendship and connection with others that we see as very, very attractive. Uh, sometimes we choose our friends and partners with approval. Um, if they approve what we say, that means that, um, that uh, it serves as a reinforcement and similar to reward values, um, makes us want to validates our behavior and validates our beliefs. Uh, we may choose people because they're similar to us. You may have similar interests, uh, similar personality characteristics, um, and the sim similarities uh, certainly lend itself well as there are similar interests and similar connected behaviors. And finally, we have complementarity. And complementarity is when we choose someone because they we back up their weaknesses and they back up ours, where our strengths back up their weaknesses. And if you've ever heard the term opposites attract, this is kind of why, uh, because when you have opposites who attract, it's uh, many in many cases due to the idea that they're, uh, that when opposites attract, it goes to the idea that uh, they're supporting one another very well um, and they're improving the well-being of an individual in ways that they wouldn't be able to do themselves. Now, when it comes to personal relationships, there are three we look at. This is when we are having individual connections with other people. Um, these are one-on-one -on -one connections that we have. Now, we may have groups with people that we're friends with and that we are connected to, but in personal relationships, whether it's friendship, whether it's family, or whether it's romantic, you it is a generally, in most cases, outside of polyamory, uh, a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Uh, and in any personal relationship, there are three distinct things that are necessary. One is equity. Equity means that both people feel equal, that they're putting an equal amount of effort and an equal amount of work. The second is self-disclosure. Uh, it's where people feel more connected when we're open and honest, especially when we, we're open and honest about those things that may make us feel uncomfortable uh, or that we may be hiding. Um, and then finally, positive support is incredibly important. Um, if you were in a friendship or relationship or family where um, all you received was negative uh, negative feedback for your actions, um, it wouldn't want you wouldn't want to probably spend a lot of time with those people anymore. <clears throat> when we talk about personal relationships, we definitely have to talk about the triangular theory of love. Well, a triangular theory of love says there's three primary aspects of love. Intimacy, which is the deep understanding of an individual that comes with uh, personal closeness. Now, intimacy can occur in romantic relationships, but also in companion relationships. And you can see from this triangle here that as you combine some of these different ideas, you can get different types of love. Passion would be the physical act of love, the hugging, the kissing, the hand-holding, um, even uh, in platonic relationships, the kind of the physical uh, nature of showing that someone is important to, to one another. And then finally, there's commitment. Uh, and commitment is when we experience uh, someone uh, really giving to us what we give to them, um, where we are not it's not, the relationship is not just one-sided. And you can see that when you have all three, intimacy, passion, and commit, commitment, you have what we call consummate love, uh, which is, according to psychology, the ultimate type of love. Finally, we look at cooperation and conflict. Cooperation is referred to as altruism. This is the term of when one carries out a behavior that 
is to, is meant to help one another. Now, sometimes, however, when we feel like we should help people, we don't. This is known as the diffusion of the response of responsibility and occurs when someone needs help. And yet when we're around other people, we in many cases will subconsciously uh, give up our responsibility. We'll say somebody else around here will do it. Um, and this diffusion of responsibility causes someone to not help. It causes someone to stand by. And then they we experience the bystander effect, which is just the idea that um, when you have people who are around others, uh, they are less likely to help someone in need. Um, if they're by themselves, they are more likely to help. And the bystander effect occurs due to this diffusion of responsibility. So why, why, why might we help? Well, there's three different ideas. The social exchange theory says that when someone helps us, we are then more likely to help somebody else. So kind of like the pay it forward idea, where if someone does something nice for us, we don't necessarily have to do it back for them. We can do it back for somebody else. The reciprocity norm we talked about just briefly when we talked about methods of persuasion. And the reciprocity norm says that when someone does something for us, good or bad, we are much more likely to do it back to towards them. And so certainly this would apply if someone helped us, then we would then turn around and help them. And finally, the social responsibility norm says that in many cases we help because it's the right thing to do, um, because it makes us feel like we are caring for others and we're supporting one another. Conflict is when two parties, people, groups, countries, etc., when two parties um, are uh, at odds with one another. Um, and conflict uh, often occurs due to social traps. Social traps are the idea that people are often trying to get what's best for themselves in the short term. Uh, but ultimately, it ends up hurting the group. Now, however big that group is, it differs in the situations. Um, but ultimately, these social traps show us that when people try to be individualistic, and uh, get what's best for them, they often uh, will not, ultimately in the long run, not do what's best for the group as a whole. Um, now, why might a conflict occur? Well, in many cases, a conflict occur occurs due to mirror image perceptions. And mirror image perceptions is when one side in a conflict sees themselves as absolutely right and, and therefore uh, morally correct. And while the other side is absolutely wrong and therefore morally incorrect, uh, the other side also sees the exact same thing about the first one. Um, and so they're both seeing the same thing. And because they're both so convinced that they're right and the others are wrong, it, it makes it difficult for people to come together. Um, finally, conflict can occur in many cases due to self-fulfilling prophecies. Now, self-fulfilling prophecies aren't only defined and connected to conflicts, but they do apply here. And a self-fulfilling prophecy is when someone develops a belief um, about their behavior um, or about what they, uh, what kind of person they are, or what kind of group they are. And then they unconsciously adjust their behavior to meet that social expectation. Um, so if you have two groups and one who's at odd with one another, uh, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, you might say, Oh, I think that person is terrible. Um, and then you're going to notice the, the little things that may bother you more about them. And you may kind of gloss over the good things that they have too. And so that unconscious kind of adjustment um, will make that belief then more true and that expectation that you have more true. This also applies in many other situations too. Finally, how do we make peace? If we're in conflict, we got to go back to cooperation. Well, it's the four C's. The four C's have to happen. One is contact. If you are not connected with the person you are in conflict, perfect person or group that you're in conflict with, then there's no way of coming to some sort of agreement, to some sort of truce, to peace. Uh, the second C is cooperation. Um, the groups or people may often decide to cooperate, even though they may be at conflict one, with one another. And this may be, may come from superordinate goals, and that's goals in which. Uh, both parties share. And so sometimes the 
working together, even though they may be, may be opposed to one another, the working together between two parties uh, can cause them to begin to cooperate and therefore make peace. Um, the third C is communication. And communication is obviously key and it's important because um, it's where one side can convince the other that uh, not to fall into the social trap, um, not to view a situation as a win-lose situation where the where if one side wins then the other side automatically loses and then therefore um, everyone's just going to do what's best for them but instead can convince them that maybe to change their behavior to do what's best for the group so that everybody uh, gets a win out of the situation and then finally we have conciliation conciliation is probably the hardest but probably the most important and it's ultimately admitting that you're wrong um, admitting that uh, at times you may be at fault or your group is at fault. Um, and sometimes in doing this, um, it uh, creates a sense of humbleness and humility uh, that can cause another person to uh, then may want to make peace because they see that, um, you, you know, you're looking at it in a different way. And that is the end of the lecture.